of the effects of this, but yet we're going ahead. I don't know if I have a vision. Which is which is which? I can't define that right now. There's so many unknowns in this development. The unknowns in these aquifers can't be answered. Yet. No one knows. Do you think the state's protecting your interests? <laughs> have to be really aware of what's going on around us. They're building all these containment ponds and they're doing different things and it moves so fast. They can drill a well in three days. There's a lot of them out there. There are 20,000 wells out there right now. Obviously, the larger the development, the more potential for environmental impact there is. I mean, just by the very nature of the fact that we have four to five million acres in the Powder River Basin all being affected simultaneously, there's going to be an environmental impact. I mean, you can't get away from that. The first thing I asked him was, would they ruin our well? And he wanted to know how deep it was. And I told him 890 feet, and he said, oh yes, we'll ruin it. But he said, we'll do you another one. But uh, that's if they were right, drilling right close, I guess he figured. If we didn't have such good neighbors to help us, we, we wouldn't be able to get along like we do. We just make ourselves at home. We drilled this artesian well in well, 36 years ago, I think it was. And it has furnished our whole place with water, the house and the, all the livestock, pastures and sheds and everything. And we had warm water year round. We didn't have to cut ice or anything for the livestock. And it was just gone overnight. <laughs> on the 2nd of September in 02. And we haven't been able to get it back. And when ours first quit flowing, I called a water well driller in Gillette. And he told me that in time, all the artesian wells were going to quit. And uh, he said, of course, it affects the whole basin underneath, it's not just within a mile or so, or half a mile, which they wanted to say. <clears throat> I'll have to run it down. Anyway, I've written to all the state people that I could think of, and I've <laughs> contacted anybody and everybody that could help us convince the methaners to drill us another well, and I haven't had any success yet. About 1983 or 82, I'm not exactly sure the time frame, it's a little hazy here, in Alabama, there were a series of underground coal mines that were being dewatered and degassed ahead of the mining operation. They'd had so many explosions in the mine, it was so unsafe that the company said, let's get the dog on water and gas the heck out of the mine first, and then we'll go down in there and mine it. 
And what they started to do is they would put these wells in the head of the mining operation. And they started pumping water out to get the water out of there. And as they started pumping the water out, the gas started coming up as well. Because that, it was secondary. What they were going to do is pump the water, then get the gas out. But by reducing the water pressure off the gas molecule, that is not inherently a part of the coal molecule. It's actually, it's a separate component. It's adsorbed against, it's stuck against the coal molecule. It's trapped by the water pressure. And when you get the water pressure down to a certain level, the molecule releases, the gas molecule. And all these water wells they put out there to relieve the water started popping the caps off and there was gas being made. And wow, look at all this gas coming up. Let's go ahead and tie these together and sell the gas product. Makes sense, and, and so they did that. It was really mom pop. And well, of course, the gas company said, whoa, ho, ho. Everybody knew there was gas in coal, but nobody figured out, could figure out how to get it out of there because they always th thought it was so low, the pressure was so low, you could never get it out. That you'd have to have significantly expensive facilities to suck the gas out. They didn't realize if you removed the water pressure, the gas would come up on its own, under its own pressure. And back in 87 and 88, the first wells were drilled in the Powder River Basin. Out on the landscape underneath the ground that we see are coal seams. They are, in many cases, saturated with water. And, and that's one of the preconditions of coal bed methane environments, that the seam is full of water, the coal is full of water. By removing some of the water, you lower the pressure, and the gas comes out. And so the process is a, a developer goes out and drills a well, looks like a conventional water well, a pump is put down into the well, um, water is pumped out of the well, which reduces the pressure within the coal seam. The uh, consequence of that is the methane that's trapped within the coal seam is released and comes up the well too. That's a very simple picture, but that's how it happens. This is uh, the collar of the well bore. This is the tubing that comes up. This tubing comes over. This is where we meter the water. The water goes back underground and goes off to the water management system. The gas comes up this collar space, and it comes over, and it flows over here, goes back underground, and it goes over to the compression. This location, it's off the main road. It's tucked away, so we are not intrusive with visual and noise aspects. We're trying to do quieter engines as well. This is for future gas hookups. So uh, that's, that's the point is that we try and get as much of this done at one time. So uh, when we turn on new wells, it goes as seamless as possible. most noticeable effect of coal bed methane development in the Powder River Basin is the fact that there is no place in the Powder River Basin that is far away from any other place anymore. The Powder River Basin used to be one of the most isolated areas in the western United States and there is no place in the whole 8 million acre area that is away anymore. That's to me the hallmark of coal bed methane. I'm not good enough with words. You know, it's an emotional thing for me. It, it's inside you is what it, what it is. There's a, an energy that comes off the Bighorn Mountains and you can just feel it. And I don't know where the compromise comes. I'd like to think that people won't come in here and just destroy the area and leave, but we, we have to watch it and we have to be on top of it, otherwise it may get destroyed. I always thought they were 1,250 horsepower compressors, but they're 1,650 horsepower compressors that are uh, pumping Fidelity gas. I don't know whether a fellow would ever get used to them. If you're trying to sleep. 34 sharp-tailed grouse would come up right to my back gate 
because I would, uh, when I change my parrot's feed dishes every day, I just throw out what they don't eat. So there was a lot of, a lot of uh, various seeds, corn and, and uh, millet and whatnot. Well, when the methane started, those guys just go down this county road 90 miles an hour. They don't care what's in the road. You know, they never slow down for birds or anything. And I'm down to 13 grouse that I feed now. One of the reasons that people, the few people that live in the Powder River Basin live here is because it is or it was far away from everything else. People that don't care to or can't live in a, in a high population environment are here and they like it and it's a richness. It is a form of wealth, solitude and open space is a form of wealth, no different from money. And the people here that are poor in money may very well be very rich in something that people with a lot of money pay a lot for. Oh, uh, CMS was the first company to drill on us. And they came to the house and just were the nicest people and the best friends we ever had, you know, and told us how wonderful this was going to be. There's no problems whatsoever with it. We're going to love it. We're just going to sit back and rake in all this money. No. No. There, uh, there are so many problems. So many with the methane development. And I really think the worst problem that they have is uh, the water. You know, they, so much water is wasted. In the initial development, as best we could estimate, in the Powder River Basin, the amount of water that was going to be withdrawn was about a quarter of a million acre feet of water a year. So 250,000 football fields covered one foot deep. When these aquifers are dewatered and the methaners leave, what are we going to do? You know, we've lost four whales, uh, three on Spotted Horse Creek that were artesian whales. Right now we're using methane water, but uh, when the water's gone from the methane whales, what are we going to do? You have to have water for cattle. There is no doubt that if someone has a water well that's completed in a coal formation that's going to be produced for CBM, and that water well is within the area of influence of the project, that water resource is going to be impaired, and it may go away. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You can't put a price in water. You can't, you can't monetarily evaluate water to, let's say it's two bucks a gallon. You can't do that because it depends on how scarce it is. And the more scarce it is, of course, the more valuable it is. And it's scarce out here. Here in this part of Wyoming, as you can see, it's very arid and our groundwater is our lifeline. You also have to recognize that you're removing water from an aquifer. The water is stored down there. It's been stored down there. In fact, we don't know how long. The draft environmental impact statement had a quote in it. Full aquifer recovery will not happen within the lifetimes of any of the state's residents. Uh, you're talking about recharging these aquifers. Isn't there some of this water that's actually pre-bomb pre water, pre-1945? So you're looking at some of these aquifers that have been down there at least, what, 60 years? Oh, there's a lot of this water that's much, much, order of magnitude more than 60 years. But then you're showing like a recharge in 15 years. Isn't there some contradiction there? There is. Good point. Let, let me work on that for a little bit. We're using examples the best examples we have and applying them to a new question, and, and which is a standard scientific approach. The unknowns that are involved in the hydrologic system out there are huge. 
The model that was done for the EIS, for example, was the best that could be done at the time with the information available. But it still treats the system as a whole. It's not. I've heard numbers quoted in the, you know, anywhere from minimums of six to eight years and recharge up to a hundred years or more. Water is the most valuable resource that we have in the state of Montana. And yet, the public agencies that are supposed to pre protect our water and our, our natural resources are ignoring us. The whole environmental impact statement process from the scoping to the final draft was nothing more than a mere formality. The state is not doing their job. The Bureau of Land Management is not doing their job. They did not take a look at the viable uh, solutions to the problems like they were required to do by law. And that, that document, the environmental impact statement, is not worth the paper it's written on. Well, it's the responsibility of the operator to propose to us and to BLM, the regulatory agencies, uh, how they plan to manage their produced water. And they, and they need to provide us with a water management plan. There are some instances where cobed methane product water is being directly discharged into stream channels. In other cases, water is being discharged into lined impoundments and evaporated away. In other cases, it's being discharged into infiltration ponds. In other cases, it's actually being used for irrigation. In other cases, it's being used for what's called land applied disposal, where irrigation delivery equipment is put out on the landscape and then water is put out in huge volumes to have it magically disappear someplace. The water is high in salt, high in sodium, and high in bicarbonates. The bicarbonates and the sodium and the salt are a deadly mix. Salt will stay in the ground for years and years and years. It'll be, it'll be here 100 years from now. You can't irrigate with this water. Stock can drink it, people can drink it, but you would not want to irrigate with this water because the, the plants can't handle it. At the Fidelity Field, in order to get rid of so much water on the fields to grow a crop with the high soda water, they uh, keep the amendment level up, they keep the sodium at a certain point, and they manage the uh, amendments by how much soda and water they're actually putting on the fields. But the likelihood of creating hard pan when you revert back out of the CBM water to the natural traditional way of irrigating is you're going to create hard pan in those fields. You know, the point is, though, that we have some of the best irrigated land in the whole world right now that does not need amendments. Right. It just needs people to leave our fresh water alone and not foul it up. I mean, and, and when they start talking about amendments and all what they're going to do for you, you assume that, that they're going to damage something. And number one, they do not have the right to damage it to start, to start with. Don't forget that the whole bugging here is just about money. And uh, they're going to oppose, and the industry always has opposed, anything that uh, reflects on their bottom line. But they usually will uh, do what the law requires them to do, and that's exactly what we're trying to do here, because they only do what they have to. And that, um, this is an effort in that direction. <laughs> okay. Now this is our surface, surface and damage agreement between Yates Energy and Bill and I. All water produced from wells drilled on the land shall be either totally contained by operator in reservoirs within the lands, re-injected by operator into underground aquifers, or piped off the lands in underground water pipelines with any such disposal plan to be pre-approved by the owner in writing. Here's the letter we got. Dear Mr. and Mrs. West, during our initial meeting in the summer of 2003 and in later discussions, Mrs. West stated that any off-channel pits constructed by Yates for the purpose of containing CBM produced water must be lined with a membrane liner. And that's right, I did. Your demand that pits or reservoirs be lined effectively nullifies the use of pits or reservoirs 
as an option to contain produced water. As you know, the agreement does not require that pits be lined, and it doesn't. All the agreement uh, says is that the water is to be totally contained. I even looked up contained in the dictionary. It says just, just what I meant. If you pour water into a glass, set it over, it is contained. If you pour water through a strainer, it isn't contained. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, if they want to take us to court, more power to them. I'll go any day. It's ridiculous. It's here in black and white. In the eastern prairie landscape, when it rains, little of the water goes into the ground and most of it runs off. And it is because the soils are not soils that have high infiltration rates. That's why those landscapes are the way they are. So when you make an infiltration pond, you are challenging the natural system out there because the natural system is not an infiltration driven system it's a runoff driven system infiltration pond simply is lengthening the tube meaning it's providing a mechanism to take the water a little bit longer down to the restrictive layer and eventually the water is going to show up down gradient to think that one can build a containment pond and walk away and have it fix itself it won't what happens to the salts in the holding pond? If the holding pond truly is a holding pond, then the pond will become a sacrifice area. In order to reclaim it, you have to have water. Well, as these projects end, what goes away? Water. You either have to say, I'm going to eventually let the thing go to dryness, then I'm going to cap it, put enough soil on it that I can grow plants on top of it, um, or I'm going to haul all this stuff away someplace and bury it someplace else. But it's not, it's not going to go away. Um, they're not going to go away. One of the problems with the science of coal bed methane is it's brand new. It's young. It's in its infancy compared to conventional oil and gas that's probably 200 years old. And because it's only 15 or 20 years old, we don't have a lot of the science yet to answer the questions that come up. But the trouble is, the only way you can get answers to the questions is to produce the coal bed methane. I live in the shadows of four power plants in coal strip. I live in the shadows of the coal mines in coal strip. So, you know, controversy is nothing, nothing new to us. But an interesting point that happened in coal strip in the early 70s is we got reclamation laws passed. And uh, you go to take a tour of the mines right now in coal strip, they will show you that reclamation. If you take a tour of the power plants in coal strip, they will show you the pollution abatement equipment on those power plants. They would have you believe that that was done out of corporate responsibility. It wasn't. We forced them to do that. The same thing needs to happen with coal bed methane development. But the only way they're going to do it is if we force them to do it that way. And it's a monumental battle. Montana history is rampant with these out of state and even out of the country companies coming in and taking our natural resources and leaving us with the problems. Berkeley Pitt is a prime example. Who paid for that? C.R. Kendall Mine at Lewistown. They packed up and left and left the people that live in that area with poison water. Who paid for that? Zort Melandisky. They're still fighting over that. The bonding didn't even come close to take care of the problems out there. So we need to take a look at our history and say, you know, we, we shouldn't have to do this again. We should learn from our mistakes. I think that a slower approach, that would be the way to do it. It would be a lot less impact on agriculture. They'd still get the gas out of the ground. Everybody would benefit from it, but it isn't happening. And I think the reason it's not happening is they're afraid that that gas will migrate, somebody else will make more money, and we've got to get it out of the ground now. And I don't have a problem with any industry making money. I have a problem with industry making money at my expense. And that's what this issue is about with agriculture. I'm trying to figure out how to say this, I'm going to offend some people, I'm sure. Because of the mood in the country when, as we're related to environmental issues, what a lot of companies are afraid of is that it may get more restricted in the future. And so they say, OK, if it's favorable right now, let's try and take care of the process and get, get our product moving out of the ground. Because if, if, the, if the administration changes, 
and the mood shifts, we've got it in the ground. Being a geologist and having worked in industry for 25 years, now as a consultant, I want to try to help the process as much as I can to make sure the environment's treated well. But in the same respect, I hate like heck to see anybody afraid that, hey, if the wrong governor or the wrong president gets in there, we're not going to be allowed to, to develop this resource. And because of that, they start really pushing hard and fast, maybe too hard and too fast in some cases, from some companies. You know, that's not, it shouldn't be that way, but it is. Basically, we are operating on a three-legged stool. One leg is the landowner. One, the other leg is the regulatory. The third leg is shareholder value. You can see there's a lot of capital employed out here. So when a company buys leases, that's capital that they're putting into a certain area. When they start drilling pilot wells, that's more capital that they're putting in that area. Then they start to uh, produce in commercial amounts. So more compressors, that's more capital. That capital that's invested has to have a competitive rate of return in order for it to be attractive to shareholders. Whether we like it or not, everyone has a vested interest in this issue. We are all, we're all energy consumers. America has this unsatiable demand for energy, you know, and, and consequently we drive the thing ourselves. And look at us, I mean, we're, we're our own worst enemy. When gas prices reached 30 cents a gallon, you know, we didn't drive anywhere. Boy, you went horseback. Well, now that you can pay almost $2 a gallon, you think nothing to get in your pickup and roaring off somewhere. I mean, we're all just stupid. We all are very spoiled. All the gas in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming would run all the nation's energy needs for one year. One year. The strongest feeling I have right now, and it might just be me and what I'm working on, is a sense of transition and the sense of passing. And a recently developed, a very deepening sense of the need to document what's passing. Because I believe that if we could document and make people aware of the richness of the social fabric, um, it would become more valuable. And people would cherish the Powder River Basin more than they do right now. Come on. Come on. Come on, Lori. Come on, sweetie. Here's a piece of cake. It's piece of cake. And she's a piece of cake. Want some dandy? Piece of cake? And piece of cake. There's my babies. Hey, there's a gentleman out of Gillette, and he uh, called me one day, and he asked me if I wanted the well replaced, and I told him no at first, because I said I wanted the methane companies to pay for it. And he said, that ain't going to happen. So he called some friends of his and told them that he, what he was trying to do, that he wanted to fix our well, and they wouldn't get anything out of it. And they thought that was a good idea. And it was pretty much of a family affair for them to do all that. And it was great. But I didn't think I would ever see the water coming out of those spouts again. I still have a lot of gas. It'll blow a dish clear out of my hand. That's my crazy thing down there. It'll start that noise, and then until the water can fill up the big supply tank again, I'm without water. I can't do a complete load of clothes. I used to run down and try to turn this knob or that knob and try to get the gas lock off it. I had the plumber down here twice. Such a mess down there. The old well was 890 feet deep. And this one was, they drilled clear down to 1550. So it's a lot deeper than the other one. But there, there just isn't any artesian wells anymore. 
they're gone. If you're lucky enough to own a portion of the minerals that lie underneath your land, yeah, you do get some money from it. But they're ruining the land, you know? And they seem to think that just because, hey, bud, I'm giving you some money, that you're supposed to smile and be all happy and not care what happens to your land. Well, I care, and my husband cares. You know, this land is going to be passed down through the generations. There's no way we're going to hold on to it ourselves through eternity. And we don't know who's going to come and, and live on the land, uh, maybe our grandchildren, maybe some guy from New York City, someone we've never heard of. But shouldn't the land remain good? It's almost like being out there with ghosts because I've gotten so sensitive to all the change that's occurred since um, since people started using the Powder River Basin, which has been a really long time. But the teepee rings and the buffalo and the soldiers and the gold miners and the homesteaders and the cattle wars and all the connivings and passionate interactions that occurred out here, and there's no trace of them. It's that change and then what's disappeared. Something that has no value, there's no need to protect it. And so it's a question of perceived valuation. If you feel there is no value or you believe that the value in development far outweighs the value of the existing, or you see no, you just don't see then, then there will be, there's no impetus to protect things.